you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, and uh, we're going to be in that text this morning. Imagine uh, sitting in a movie theater in 1927. Anybody in here, can they remember sitting in a movie theater in 1927? Anybody there? If you were sitting in the movie theater in 1927, it would look quite different than today. You see, the, the picture would be all in black and white, of course, and there would be no sound that was the silent movie era. Well, it was in this year, in 1927, that Cecil DeMille released a movie entitled King of Kings. By today's standards, the movie is fairly archaic. Jesus is pictured as a tall white man who loves children. You can see this picture here. Um, it doesn't exactly um, look like somebody you'd want to nail to a cross, does he? Very, very uh, kind and uh, tall and very white. Doesn't look very Jewish there. But one of the things about the, um, the movie that would have caught you off guard in 1927 is if you're watching this movie, when it gets to the resurrection scene, all of a sudden... The movie is in color. Now, it's not color by today's standards. If you go on YouTube and take a look at it, it's very uh, fainted. They had to actually paint each frame. But it would have been quite a feat in 1927. DeMille understood that the resurrection of Jesus is the climax of the story, right? And so he brought color into the movie at that time. And in the same way today, the resurrection of Jesus brings color to our drab world, doesn't it? So as we gather this Easter, we are here to celebrate the climax of the story, the main point of the story. Now if we think about it, and I'm sure there are people who are talking about this today, that the resurrection is quite a claim, isn't it? In fact, there's no such religion in all of the world that has these claims. Not, not in Judaism. Nothing in the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament would claim that someone had actually risen from the dead. Sure, there were mythological stories, but people kind of understood those as fairy tales. They really didn't believe him. But here, we have this person that everybody knew. He's walking around. He's talking to people. He's living life with them. And then he's publicly crucified on a cross. Everyone saw it. And then three days later, his followers say he is alive. He is risen from the dead. For the next six weeks, people saw him. People interacted with him. People ate with him. This morning, we're going to look at one account this morning. It is the account of the two women. So as you have your Bibles open to Matthew 28, I'll put all the verses on the screen that aren't in Matthew 28, but you'll want to read that text in front of you this morning. Last week, we journeyed through Matthew 26 and 27, or the last two weeks we have. And then today, we come to Matthew 28, and Matthew writes of this tremendous event, beginning in verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So Matthew begins his account with these two women. Now let me mention there are other accounts in the Bible of the resurrection. In fact, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read Paul kind of summing up all of these accounts. Paul says, For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Now, Paul is kind of running down all of these accounts. And do you notice what is missing from Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 15? He doesn't mention the women at the tomb. Why was Paul doing this? Now, Paul was trying to make a case, as you would in a court of law. He was saying, look, Christ is risen, and this is how we know he is risen. And a woman's testimony in the first century had no standing in a court of law. So Paul doesn't mention the women. 
Women were regarded as nobodies in these days. They were considered property in some cases, even sold in other cases in the first century. And they certainly could not bear witness in a court of law. Isn't it interesting though, that when God chooses to reveal himself as resurrected, the first people that he appears to are women. Now, you might say, well, if it, why, would it, why, would he, why would God do this? And why would the, the apostles tell it like this? Well, if you're trying to make up a story, you're certainly not going to put this in there, right? The only reason that the women are in the story is because this is how it really happened, right? This is what happened. Isn't that just like God, though? God comes as a baby and he's not placed in a palace. He's placed in a manger, right? The first visitors are smelly shepherds. And the first people that he appears to are women. Again, low in society. But this time, the smell is better with the women, right? But the women are coming to the tomb. And Matthew simply tells us that they're coming to anoint Jesus' body. Mark gives us a little more detail. Again, leave your... Bible's open to Matthew. I'll put the, the verses of Mark up on the, up on the screen here. Mark chapter 16 verse 1 says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they may, might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. Now, what you might want to know is that the Sabbath is on Saturday, right? You couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. You couldn't buy stuff. So the women could not buy spices. But in the Jewish way of thinking, the day begins and ends at sunset, not at midnight like today. So at sunset on the Sabbath, the women would have been allowed to buy spices. So very likely they bought their spices on Saturday evening, but they're not going to go to a tomb in the dark. So they wait until Sunday morning and they go. Back to Matthew verse 1. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So they go to the tomb to anoint the body. Now, this was just customary. This is what women did in that day and time. Now, you might have noticed when we put the Mark passage up there that Mark mentions three women. Matthew mentions two. Mark mentions three. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Mark tells us that they were worried about how they were going to get in the tomb. You have to wonder, did they just kind of think of this on the way? Oh, wow, how are we going to get in there, right? Mark says in verse 3, they ask each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Matthew continues to describe the event in verse 2. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. See the women didn't have to worry very long about this because God had already taken care of it, right? Now do you see the connection here? There is an earthquake here. And do you remember what happened when Jesus died? If you go back to Matthew 27, we read, When a centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they, te they, te they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely this was the Son of God. So we had an earthquake at Jesus' death and now an earthquake at his resurrection. Back to Matthew ch uh, verse 20, but chapter 28, verse 2. It was a violent earthquake. For the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. So an earthquake happens. Whether the earthquake, you know, helped the stone roll, we're not sure. But the angel rolls the stone away. And Matthew describes the angel sitting on the stone. Look how he describes it in verse 3. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. Now, this description sounds a lot like the, trans the transfiguration of Jesus. Do you remember that? Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, uh, James and John and Peter go with Jesus to a mountain and they see Jesus transfigured. And when he's transfigured, this is what he looks like. Same words here. He's white and he's white like lightning. He's white and he's white like snow. Now, this is the kind of white that you don't normally see around here, right? We know that the angel is from from heaven and his appearance kind of tells us that. Now when he appears he freaks out everybody around him here. First of all he freaks the guards out. Look at verse 4. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. 
it's almost humorous here how Matthew's describing this, isn't it? Because who's supposed to be dead now? Jesus, right? But these guys are looking like dead men because they're so afraid. And the one who is dead is not dead, right? He is risen. Evidently, the women are pretty freaked out too. So the angel speaks to them in verse 5. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He verifies again. I know why you're here. I know you're looking for Jesus. And truly, he was crucified. Truly, he was dead. You are looking for him. He's supposed to be here in the tomb. Crucified people are generally in tombs. That's just where they are. But look what he says in verse 6. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where they lay. Now, he's supposed to be here, but he's not. Because he has risen. Those are three of the most powerful words in all of scripture, aren't they? Those are the three words in which our faith hinges, right? He has risen. Now, I think it's interesting here. He doesn't say, Jesus doesn't rise in front of them, right? In fact, we don't know of anybody who sees Jesus rise. And in fact, the, the stone being rolled away, a lot of times you see it, you know, in the cartoons where the stone's rolled away and Jesus busts out of the grave, you know. That's not what's happening here. The only reason the stone has to get rolled away is that the women can see the empty tomb. Jesus has already risen. He has already come to life here. Now, this, the stone is rolled away so the women can see what's going on here. Now, you might ask the question this morning, how do dead people rise? I mean, that, that's just hard for me to wrap our minds around. And this morning, I, I suppose people all over the world are asking that question. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? But think about this for a moment. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, we know and we understand that we all die, right? And we die because of sin. Because of Adam and Eve. And each one of us have sinned. And each one of us will die because of that sin. But what if someone never sinned? Would that person have to die? No, they wouldn't have to die. But what if they chose to die? You see, their dying would then have the power to break the curse of sin and death. And this is exactly what happened. Jesus was perfect, no sin, and he submitted to death. A death he did not have to die, and because of this, he now has power over death. You see, death could not hold him. Paul quotes one of the earliest Christian hymns in Philippians 2, and we saw a paraphrase of that earlier on in our worship. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The father, the women coming to the tomb that morning were able to see what happened. You see, God shook the earth. He opened the tomb for all to see. The curse had been broken. Death had been overcome. What the Father, the Son, and the Spirit had been planning since the Garden of Eden was now come to fruition. The mission was accomplished. Death was defeated. He has risen just as he said. Come on in. Take a look. Check it out for yourselves. Then look at what the angel tells the women to do next in verse 7. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I have told you. Now, you can imagine the women would be in shock. I mean, can you imagine all that they had experienced just in the last few days? I mean, they're traumatized. They, they saw Jesus nailed to a cross. They spent a whole day mourning, trying to figure out what was going on. They make it to the tomb, and when they get there, the stone is rolled away. An angel is telling them that Jesus has risen from the dead. Isn't it pretty cool to see that God reveals this first to women? I mean, they were the ones who stuck it out with Jesus, right? The disciples all freaked out and fled. But the women are the one. The women are the one who who stuck it out. Who 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 stuck it out with Jesus? And we see Jesus appearing first to them. 
Now, God is not going to keep this a secret. He's going to also appear to the disciples. So he tells the women here, we want you to go and tell the disciples. And look what they are to say. He's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. Now, if you go back to Matthew chapter 26, you might remember Jesus saying these exact words. Jesus said, but after I have risen, what will I do? I will go, to, uh, go ahead of you into Galilee. Angel finishes the statement, now I've told you. That's what angels do. The word angel simply means messenger. He said, I've delivered the message and I'm finished. They didn't have a conversation evidently. <laughs> he had the message and he delivered it. Verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. You know, I don't know how you picture the women kind of leaving the tomb. Sometimes you just picture them running and singing and hands up in the air and they're all happy because Jesus had risen from the dead. But that's not at all what's happening here, is it? What does Matthew tell us? Matthew tells us that they're afraid. They're scared. They're not sure what's going to happen next. And then remember, Jesus had been crucified. They saw all of this happen. Now he's risen and they don't know what the implications of this are. But they do what they're told to do. Matthew adds in verse 8, so the women hurried away from the tomb. Let's see, I want to I read Mark chapter 16, verse 8. Look at Mark's account of this. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Do you, do you see the, the, how, how Mark describes them? I mean, they're trembling. They're bewildered. They're, they're freaked out. They're scared. They're not sure what's going to happen next. But if we look over in Matthew, verse 8, Matthew says they hurried away from the tomb. And Matthew adds this. Look, Matthew says they were afraid, yes, but they were filled with joy. That's an interesting word, that word joy. In fact, we don't see it a whole lot in Scripture. As much as you hear it around Christmas time, you would think it'd be all over the place, right? But Matthew only uses that word twice once here and once in, in, in when the wise men now he does use it in the parable some but in, in the wise men in Matthew chapter 2 verse 10 when they saw the star they were overjoyed so here are the women freaking out they're running they're afraid yet they're full of joy but the story doesn't end there let's keep reading look at verse 9 suddenly Jesus met them greetings he said now, Matthew's language is quick here. Do you notice all the words here? Quickly. The angels told him to go quickly. They hurry. And suddenly, Jesus appears to them. I imagine the women telling Matthew about this. It all happened so fast. We didn't know what was going to happen next. And suddenly, all of a sudden, Jesus is there. There he was. One scholar points out that most of the time when you see Jesus written in scripture, Jesus is the object of the sentence. People come to Jesus. People do this to Jesus. But now we see Jesus as the subject of the sentence. Jesus comes to them. In other words, they're not looking for him. They're not expecting him. They don't think he's going to be there, but he does. He shows up. He comes to them. And all of their fear, all of their doubt, all of their trauma, all of their confusion is now to the side because Jesus is there. He has met with them. And look at how they respond in verse 9. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And I think these words, clasp his feet... Do you remember when Jesus was being anointed by Mary over in Luke chapter 7? We read, and she stood behind him, behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. There's something about these women being at Jesus' feet. In the first century, it was a sign of submission to be at one's feet. It was a sign of saying that you are Lord of all. And so here are the women, they're clasping his feet. And Matthew uses one more word here. He says they clasped his feet and they worshipped him. Now again, I want to take you back to the wise men. It's the same word that was used there. They were overjoyed because they had found the Savior and they worshipped him. Matthew 2.2 2. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. It's the same word that's used to describe the men in the boat when Jesus is walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14. 
Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. You see, this word worship, it has to do with recognizing who Jesus is. That he is the Son of God. And so here we have these women grabbing his feet and worshiping him. I think one of the most puzzling passages in all of Scripture is a little bit later on in this chapter. If you look down at verse 17 there, we read this. When they saw him, and this is talking about a larger group of disciples, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that a crazy verse? Can you imagine seeing the resurrected Jesus in person and doubting? But yet that is the response of some who see him. Maybe they're just thinking, I don't quite know what I'm experiencing here. I'm not sure if this is real. Am I having a vision? What's going on here? But, but there's the contrasting ways in which we can approach the resurrection of Jesus. We can worship like the women or we can doubt. And that's really the two choices that we have. But here are the women. They see the resurrected Jesus. They clearly believe. They clearly get it. And they worship him. That really is the appropriate response at Easter. It is a confession. It is a response that Jesus is God. It is a confession. It is a response that says we know who he is. He is the son of God. As I was driving in this morning, I was thinking about, you know, today's Easter. And as I drove by neighborhood after neighborhood, I thought, you know, there's probably a lot of people laying in their beds this morning. A lot of people, maybe they'll get out and mow the grass today, maybe take care of some things around the house, they'll enjoy the day off work. But you and I are gathered in this place this morning. We are worshiping. We are confessing that Jesus is God, that he is risen from the dead. Now we really don't know how long this lasts, but the women are there clasping his feet, worshiping him. But Matthew tells us what happens next. Look what Jesus says, verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Why does Jesus tell them to not fear? Or why were they fearing? Why were they afraid? You have to wonder, perhaps their greatest fear was that nobody was going to believe them when they told them what they were seeing, right? I mean, they're women. They don't have a lot of credibility to begin with. And, and I could imagine they might think, well, nobody's going to believe us if we say that someone has risen from the dead. But Jesus says, don't worry. Don't fear. He says, I'm going ahead of you. And others will see me too. And notice what he calls the disciples here in this text. What does he call them? He calls them, my brothers. Now, you might think that Jesus would be a little ticked off at them, right? Because they abandoned him in his worst moment, in his greatest hour of need. They're sleeping, right? When he's being crucified on the cross, they're leaving, all but John, right? But he calls them still his brothers. He's forgiven them. He's with them. He says, they're going to experience what you have experienced. What a story. What a story to read on Easter Sunday. What an appropriate story for us to come to this morning. You might ask the question, well, what does this story have to do with us here in 2014? The account does have implications for us today. And I think there's several different ones. I want to point out just a few. First of all, I think that this story teaches us that Jesus often comes to the lowly, doesn't he? And the fact that there are two women in today's culture, we might think, well, that doesn't really mean anything. But in the first century, it would have been shocking for the first people to see his resurrected body where it would be women. But Jesus comes to women. I think that's on purpose. I think we want to see in this text that God is saying, no matter who you are, no matter how low you think you are, no matter how bad you think you've sinned, Easter is for you, you see. He comes to the lowly. You think, who, who, who could Jesus have appeared to first? I mean, if I were Jesus, I think, you know, maybe I would appear first to the religious leaders, you know. They're the ones who had him killed, right? Wouldn't you love to just show up and say, hey guys, look, here I am. <laughs> Resurrected from the dead. Or maybe he would appear to the Roman soldiers first, right? The ones who nailed him to the cross. For, to, to be able to stand in front of them and say, look guys, your killing machine didn't work this time, right? Death could not hold me. You thought I was dead, but I'm risen. You see, but he didn't. He comes first of all to the lowly women. And I think there is a, there, there's something to be said of that. Maybe this morning you feel like you're not sure if you deserve God. Maybe you've wandered in here this morning because you think, well, I'm supposed to be in church on Easter. But inside you're thinking, I know that God could never forgive me for what I've done. 
maybe this morning the message of Easter for you is that God came to the low. And you're, you're not too low for him. There's no sin that he cannot forgive. Secondly, this morning, I think that this text teaches us that the appropriate response at Easter is simply worship. And what is worship? Worship is simply confessing, you are God, you are risen. I put my faith in you, I trust in you. And again, maybe some of you this morning are having a hard time, you feel like you can't worship, but worship is simply confessing. And I think you're being here this morning and you're saying, you are God. That, that, is, that, is, that is what the appropriate thing to do. Again, no fireworks, no high media attention this morning. We're simply gathered in this place, worshiping, believing. You think, I think, I think Jesus is less interested in Super Bowl crowds and he's more interested in people who are humbly worshiping his name. So we confess today that Jesus is risen. And we confess this morning that because he is risen, he is Lord. Lastly, this morning, this text reminds us that this is the center of our faith. He is risen. And the resurrection of Jesus, as DeMille discovered in 1927, really does bring color to our drab worlds, doesn't it? We have assurance this morning that death is temporary because of the risen Christ. The curse is broken. Death is defeated. The world is going to be made right again because Jesus is risen. This is the message of Easter. And may we live in it not only today, but as Jim said, each and every day. May we live our lives because Jesus is is risen. May it affect the way we go into our offices, into our workplaces, into our classrooms. He is risen. So as we prepare to leave this place this morning, may we take it all in. You know, the flowers are beautiful this morning, right? People may be dressed up a little bit more. I'm even wearing a tie this morning, right? It's Easter. But may it be more than the flowers and the dresses, and the sunshine, and the spring weather. May it be something inside of us that says, truly, the world is different. Truly, life is worth living because he lives. This morning, we're going to invite the band to come back. And we're going to have a time of response. An appropriate song. How deep the Father's love for us, we're going to sing. Then we're going to take an offering and then we're going to close uh, with I Will Rise this morning. If there's a decision you'd like to make, uh, you come now as God would lead you. If you want to come and pray, the altar is open.